I was paying such close attention to what he said that I forgot that I need something for the dramatic reading. <clears throat> um, I have an ambitious program today. <clears throat> uh, it'll be mostly audiovisual, <clears throat> so, uh, and it'll even be in several languages, and you'll even hear a little bit of unexpected music. <clears throat> now, why? Um, as you heard, <clears throat> Uh, over 20 years ago, <clears throat> I was already in my early 60s, I decided to turn myself into an, what I'd call an intellectual smuggler. <clears throat> uh, you know, I've been a scientist for half a century, <clears throat> and uh, most research scientists really don't communicate very much with the public. <clears throat> uh, I was no particular exception. In other words, you spoke to your colleagues because you wanted to impress them and the public can't do anything for you for your professional standing, let's say, as an organic chemist. If I want to believe that I'm a good organic chemist, then, I don't know, the 12 or 27 most important organic chemists in the world have to think so. And if the Irish Times thinks so, it makes no difference. <clears throat> and that's, of course, a, you know, a lesson that everyone has learned. <clears throat> but when you get old enough, it doesn't make that much difference anymore. And particularly because of the work that I did in the area of reproduction, <clears throat> or particular actually reproduction, in this case contraception, <clears throat> and realized after, well, when the pill got on the market <clears throat> and many of the important issues were not really scientific ones, but uh, social ones, <clears throat> cultural ones, religious ones, and particular women's uh, rights, <clears throat> that you have to communicate with a very different public if you want to <clears throat> debate these issues. I still remember my first visit to Dublin <clears throat> at the invitation of a friend of mine who sits there, Professor Donnelly, <clears throat> in 1981, when my, the British publication of my first book addressed to general public, after I'd written quite a number of books and hundreds of papers, uh, came out. It was called The Politics of Contraception. Uh, I talked at that time, not at Trinity College, but University College Dublin, and it happened that either the week before or the week after the Pope came to Ireland and spoke uh, primarily against uh, contraception. And I still remember <clears throat> the talk we had <clears throat> here, which was really uh, a wonderful one, wonderful one. I'm not necessarily saying that mine was wonderful, although usually they are. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> it, was, uh, it was a charged atmosphere because that was really a, a real debatable topic at that time. And there were lots of people in there, of course, who were <clears throat> dubious or even against uh, <clears throat> contraception, which was perfectly reasonable. And they expected that I would just be a pill pusher. And I was not that. I never was and never am. Uh, so what we really had was some rather good debates. And then I remember 10 years later when I actually came here to Trinity uh, College. Uh, oh, and at that time, <clears throat> the, the Irish Times had a, a full-page article on that and it dis uh, discussed, you know, the various issues. Uh, ten years later, when I came here again and uh, spoke about a similar topic and some other things, uh, <clears throat> the Irish Times again had a long article. And if you read these two articles, which are the only two that I've read in the Irish Times, so ten years apart, you think that you're, you're in two different countries. At least you were. Those ten, that ten-year difference was really extraordinary. So I'm extremely pleased to be here <clears throat> again, although in between, I was here <clears throat> in the hat which I'm wearing now, <clears throat> namely as a uh, theater author. And that was here at Trinity College uh, in, uh, in uh, it was 2005, which was the year of physics internationally. It was the year of Einstein in Switzerland. It was the year of Hamilton here in Ireland. And uh, they did a play of mine, uh, Calculus, dealing with Newton and Leibniz. And it was really a, a very memorable performance, which I enjoyed greatly. Well, what am I doing here today other than having accepted a gracious invitation? I told you I wanted to become a smuggler, meaning that I wanted to talk about issues that are related to science. Uh, they wouldn't have to be necessarily about science itself, but I was particularly interested, am particularly interested, in the behavior of scientists. It's a very idiosyncratic, <clears throat> Uh, tribal culture, and we as scientists are very, most of us, are not self-reflective. We do not really think what's special about this culture, particularly because we are brought up in it. And you don't learn this in textbooks, you don't learn it in lectures, uh, you learn it by osmosis 
from your mentors and from your colleagues. And uh, <clears throat> I want to do it a different way. I want to talk about these issues. If I gave a lecture, well, you know, even this here, the only people who come are the people who are interested, positively or negatively. You may be against the issue, you may be for it, but you're interested. But of course, I'm interested to really touch the other 99.9% .9 of the people. And they either are not interested in science, they are anti-scientific, they are ascientific, they may be illiterate or they may be illiterate, scientifically speaking, or they may simply be uh, afraid. And that's very often the case when I try to talk to someone as a scientist, which I'm not going to be doing today. Uh, they'll start saying, I don't understand science, and then they don't really listen to what you're saying, even though you may try to do it in language that's perfectly intelligible. So I thought I would smuggle it, and that was the reason why I first wrote fiction, which I call science in, in fiction, to differentiate from science fiction, because what I wrote about was true or plausible, had happened or is about to happen, these are all things that are not necessarily the case in science fiction, which of course is a very popular genre, and for my purposes, useless, because I have didactic purposes, I'll, agree, I'll admit this. And so if I want to teach something, even through some smuggling device, it has to be true, otherwise no purpose in really doing this. And after I did this, I wrote five novels and did a lot of other things and gave a lot of talks about it. Um, and I do, did this commuting between San Francisco, where I live primarily, and uh, London, where I've lived for 20 years, and where I go a lot to the theater. I've always come to the theater. And I see a lot of plays. And usually they're not comedies or musicals. They're the type of plays that interest me that I also write, which have an intellectual context. Uh, they have... Uh, they try to have sophisticated language. There are very few four-letter words in it, and I think in the contemporary English and American theater, there are some very good plays where every second word is fuck. And uh, that works sometimes on the stage. It does not work if you want to read a play, because it's always the same thing. You know, I mean, you can just repeat the same word. And uh, I'm coming to this topic in a little while about a reading plays so rather than just seeing them. But the other thing that really interests me, that was probably a driving force. Not only that at that time when I started writing plays, which was in the uh, late-ish 1990s, where there were very few plays about science, and many more now, uh, but also that we scientists are not permitted and do not permit ourselves to use dialogue in our written discourse. And yet, from the Greeks, through, let's say, 17th century or beginning of 17th century, dialogue was a very common <clears throat> literary genre. Now, everything written dialogical, you assume it's a play. And uh, even though many of these things have no relationship to plays, think about Galileo, for instance, who wrote many things in dialogic form. Erasmus of Rotterdam, one of the greatest Renaissance uh, humanists wrote quite a number of important issues in dialogic form. We don't do this anymore. So I wanted to do that and did it in the only manner which is permitted to us, so to speak, which is the theater. And uh, I've now written 10 plays. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I will start actually with this here. This is, this is a book, first of all, you see. It's not a uh, <clears throat> usual play. Uh, it's, too, it's called Sex in an Age of uh, Technological Reproduction. It contains two plays. One is called Ixi, and the other one is called Taboos. And a number of you can then pick it up afterwards, and you will not have to pay for it. <clears throat> uh, but I would suggest that only those of you should pick it up, because I don't think there are enough copies. There are not enough copies for everyone here who would really interest in the topic, rather than just collecting books and putting them on a coffee table. There's also a DVD in here. There are two very different plays. And I've written two of the one kind and eight of the other kind. And I'd like to start with the two that I've written, which will not be germane to the talk that I'm giving today. Uh, namely, pedagogic plays, openly pedagogic plays, which are for schools, schools, universities, but for instruction. And they take about 45 or 50 minutes, in other words, the class time, and are done in completely dialogic form. So one of them is called X in this case, uh, ICSI, and I won't ask you to raise your hand, <clears throat> but you know what 
exist because I'm sure that the majority of you do not. And that has nothing to do with being ignorant or not, because it's an acronym. And you know, we are full of acronyms in, in science anyway. Uh, it stands for intercytoplasmic sperm injection, which is a complicated word for injecting <coughs> an egg with a single sperm. And that is a reproductive method, an in vitro fertilization method, discovered in 1991 in Belgium, which is probably the most revolutionary of them all, and has had an enormous impact, and not just in terms of reproduction, but in other really ethical and other uh, senses. And I wanted to introduce it in that particular play. Uh, <clears throat> and that, as you'll see there, is done in the format, a little bit like this here. Uh, the students themselves should do it rather than professors. <clears throat> and they'll sit here, just two people. <clears throat> and it's in the context of a TV talk show, as a live audience. So you're the audience of the TV show, the two of them sit here. One of them is a TV moderator, a woman, very green, green in the context of politically, otherwise very sophisticated. Uh, but basically critical of science. And the other one's an older scientist uh, who is rather optimistic about things. And of course, in a way, they they argue, uh, because I, it's very important that I want to present both sides of the issue. I don't really give you the final answer. That was one play. Uh, the other one, which is called Taboos, which is, <clears throat> which I wrote on the, it came out three years ago, had its premiere in London and then in, in, um, in New York <clears throat> and in a number of other countries. It's played for two years in Bulgaria, for instance. It uh, deals with the topic of words that are very simple words family, marriage, baby, twin, embryo, these six words. If you ask anyone on the street, you know, define marriage, they'll say, you are nuts. I mean, I don't, need a, I don't need a dictionary for this. Of course, I can tell you what family means, what marriage means, what child means. <clears throat> In actual fact, these words have all changed. There are all kinds of alternatives to that, which weren't possible 20 or 30 years ago. Some of them are even 10 years ago and I address these in the form of a very provocative, uh, contentious play in which I present, actually, on the one hand, an it's an American play, so two San Francisco lesbians, this is probably the most politically uh, liberal, extreme part of the United States, and two very religious uh, Baptist fundamentalists from the South, which is exactly the opposite. And I'm very much concerned about fundamentalism as such. But so I want to address in that case, and you would read it here, how uh, the issues, uh, these charged issues of reproduction are addressed. So much about that. That's all I want to mention here. Now, uh, <clears throat> the first play I've written, which is called An Immaculate Misconception, uh, premiered at the Edinburgh Fringe in 1998, has now been translated into 12 languages. Uh, and the BBC broadcast on the World Service and lots of other places. The only reason why I'm mentioning it, because you can see that is a play that at least in terms of languages had a resonance in many different places. And I, the reason why I'm starting with this before I come to the main topic, because we're talking about the elements, we're talking about chemistry, we're talking about oxygen, uh, <clears throat> is... Um, uh, <clears throat> well... How shall I put it? Uh, <clears throat> suddenly lost my train of thought because I wanted to say something else. I was jumping ahead. Uh, well, anyway, <clears throat> get to it in a moment. Uh, yes, it's um, if you write a film, if you do a film, it can be first class, wonderful film. If you show it anywhere in the world, it is always exactly the same. You can change nothing except for the language, which is either dubbed or subtitles, but that only diminishes the play, but it, uh, the movie, but it does, absolutely changes nothing. If you do a theater piece, it's never the same. It's never the same, even if you, the same group does it in the same language in the same theater, because the dynamics between the audience, the live audience and live actors, really affects the performance. But much more important, and that's what I want to make a case about the different languages. As you perform a play in different, social and cultural settings, it can be changed tremendously, not only by the author himself, but even if he or she doesn't want to, the directors in these different places will do so. And the place will be, can be very different. But the great advantage that if the author is still living, in my case, 
I may still barely be living, but I'm still living. I am actually the one who has made many of the changes. And I found it extraordinary, because that's a play on which there are 24 uh, uh, versions by now of uh, Immaculate Misconception, because I've changed it. And uh, it has only basically three characters and a kid. But uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know, I remember in Singapore, I, did, I had one Chinese and two English people. And in, in a Portuguese production, it was two Portuguese and a Brazilian. I mean the characters, uh, a Russian and American. So, so you can make changes, which are really quite wonderful. And I would like to illustrate this in a way uh, with what I'll now start on. I'll start with the play Oxygen, which was my second play, and it's the only play that I've written together with someone else, a very famous chemist, Roald Hoffman, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1981. Uh, we are good friends, and we both happen to be <clears throat> somewhat unusual chemists. We're in totally different areas. He's a theoretician, I'm really an experimentalist. But we both have been interested for many, many years uh, while we're still, in his case, he's still a scientist, with me, uh, even though I, when I was fully workaholically occupied with chemistry, I was interested in other things as well, theater, opera, art, and I read a fair amount. So uh, he felt like I do, he's a very good poet, uh, and he writes nonfiction, doesn't write fiction. So we decided to collaborate on this play, and the play came out in 2001. Why 2001? Because that was the 100th anniversary of the Nobel Prize. And we wanted to write something about uh, that event. Uh, we both know quite a lot about the awarding of Nobel Prize and how people are picked, because we are both members of the Swedish Academy, foreign members of the Swedish Academy of Sciences. And one of the few privileges you have is to attend these meetings when you pick a Nobel Prize. When I, the foreign people can't vote, but at least you can be present and see what is happening. And of course, in the case of Roald Hoffman, he himself uh, also won a Nobel Prize, although it doesn't necessarily mean that you know what's going on inside. But uh, we did, and we wanted to write about this. And the theme that we really, the overall theme is, what does discovery mean in science? No, 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 not yet. No, 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 not yet. Uh, almost. And that is, uh, has never really been answered. Because does it mean who did it first, who published first, who understood it first? And the interesting part of it with oxygen, that is exactly the situation, as you'll see. So we wrote this play uh, about the Nobel Prize, postulating something amusing, namely that the Swedish Academy of Sciences uh, at the 100th anniversary to celebrate has formed a new Nobel Prize called the Retro Nobel. And the Retro Nobel will be given for dead people rather than living ones and for work that was done before 1901. So then there would be no real arguments about this. So I'll, without any further ado, I'd now like to show you a little bit of the second scene because the first scene is in a sauna with three semi-naked women, which were the women of the three men, and who debate their husband's work in a sauna. But then we shift back and forth between 1777 and 2001. This is the first 2001 scene, and could I have that, please? <clears throat> A member of the Nobel Committee. A retro Nobel for work done before 1901. What a way to celebrate the centenary of the Nobel Prize. At least the losers won't be able to hold it against us. It's different, I suppose. Recognizing dead people. It's still too much work. We always complain about time spent on Nobel Committee business. Oh, Swedes would be proud to pay the prize. You pay, I'm tired of paying it. My work suffers. So is I. A chance, I like the power. And the gossip. <laughs> Choosing a dead winner, they don't even repay favors. You don't mean that? I'm just being honest. Well, this thing has its place, but this isn't it. Oh, I'm surprised to hear that from you, Paul people. You would say that? With Oscar as chairman of the Nobel Committee, this would be interesting. She prefers to be called chairperson. Never had a woman before. She deserves it. Damn good theoretician. In my experience, theoreticians make lousy chairmen. But when it comes to Oscar, I wouldn't generalize. Besides, she always gets her way. <laughs> Which you know from personal experience, of course. Ha ha ha, that was a lifetime ago. At least four years than I care to remember. 
And here she comes down with her shadow, mysterious from the sword. Alistair, have you told them about me? Not yet, Emma. They must be wondering. I'm sure they are. Nobel Committee secretaries are usually older. And aren't they expecting the chemistry? <coughs> That's why I called an amanuensis. We're going to tell them what I do. It's so serious. All in good time. Trust me. Good morning, gentlemen. You're early? No, we're punctual, like all of us, we. You haven't changed, Faint. No, just a little, surely. You want my love on? Shall we get to work? We're here to decide on the first draft for a Nobel for work done before 1901. I assume you have all the relevant papers? A uh, procedural question. Why are only four of us? You've never had fewer than five members. You have no deadlocks with an odd number committee. <laughs> just so that always complaining. It's my decision. Any other questions? So our choices are restricted to the 19th century or earlier. At least we have fewer Americans. In fact, only one. Who really gives? What's chemistry without thermodynamics? Not an American again. Please. The choice is obvious. Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev. Can you imagine chemistry without the periodic table? It's our Rosetta Stone. What about Louis Pasteur? The prizes should be distributed to benefit all mankind. That's what it says in Alfred Nobel's will. If you stop people on the street with the question, who has conferred the greatest benefit on mankind? Gibbs, Mendeleev, or Pasteur, they'll say Gibbs. Never heard of them. Mendeleev, spell it. Everyone knows Pasteur. But we aren't people on the street. Wait a minute. Is this part of the formal meeting? We are just the usual Nobel Committee preparing our recommendations to the Academy on who should win the prize. This time we're also generating a short list. We need a record to show it was all the course. So ways we were asked to do both. <laughs> Back to business. We have Gibbs, Mendeley, and Pastor. What other names would you like to throw into the pot? Why not a sweep for the first one? When it came to the regular Nobel Prizes, the Academy waited until 1903 before getting into a ring. He can't just be Swedish, he also has to deserve it. Alright, what a sweep? What about um, Carl Wilhelm Scheler for the discovery of oxygen? Out the 18th century? Why not early? He probably wants to give it to an alchemist, maybe even Paracelsus. The 18th century might not be a bad idea. People publish less, so we had less to read. <laughs> At least like Shayla, what about Antoine Laurent Lavoisier? Yeah, Joseph Priestley. Right back to the usual Nobel quandary, too many candidates. What about John Dalton, the father of the atomic theory? <clears throat> Nonsense. Uh, oxygen had to be discovered first, maybe for the second or third retro of that. All to the point. Oxygen started the chemical revolution, became a science, quantitative measurements, the real elements of play. Absolutely. Everybody else, Dalton, Gibbs, Mendeleev, and all the Nobel Prizes. <laughs> Since yes. 1901, Thank you. Before the chemical revolution, people were convinced that when things burned, something was released. You can turn it off. Thank you. Uh, well, you get the idea. <clears throat> and then uh, they start uh, vote, not voting, deciding how to proceed. Each of them, <clears throat> each of these men, take one presumable candidate, Lavoisier, <clears throat> uh, Shelley, or Priestley and uh, then study them, and they move back and forth between 70 and 77 where you see something about them, and then the modern uh, analysis, so to speak. And uh, what we postulated that King Gustav the third, who at that time was the king of Sweden, and actually was interested in uh, upper round performances, the mass ball, Verdi's mass ball, is about him, and is in Drottingholm, in this theater in, uh, in Stockholm, so we postulate that King Gustav had invited these three people to Stockholm and to demonstrate with real experiments on the stage, in this case, how they made oxygen and who was the first one. And you see that in there. And then play ends with um, a vote. So now, <clears throat> I'm not going to show you the whole play. Incidentally, you could <clears throat> read it if you wanted to, because uh, this play has been translated into 16 languages until a few weeks ago, now it's 17, because it was just translated into Catalan. Uh, and it's come out in about nine languages in book form, and also in English, so you could read it. And before I proceed with this, I do want to make one point about reading plays. <clears throat> I believe that there are plays, not just the canonical plays, uh, Shakespeare, Moliere, Schiller, or let's say Beckett, uh, <clears throat> uh, if we're here in Ireland, uh, but modern plays, because most plays are really not performed. 
I don't mean never performed, but they're performed here and there for a week, a month, a year, and then probably not for quite a number of years. But many of these plays make very good reading, and reading dialogically is a great pleasure because you can sort of play the roles in your head, and you can even do them loud, and you can even do them with friends of yours, and so on. Now, I've, I'm a great believer in that, and I've convinced, in my case, it's important that it's not theater publishers because they are, have a very limited distribution, but literary publishers should be willing to do that. And that has been the case in many of the plays uh, uh, that I've written uh, because I uh, really believe in this. And I want to very quickly tell you an experiment that I did uh, last year and which I think is probably unique. I say probably unique. It may not be, but I don't know of any examples. Uh, if you write a play for the reader, then you can't really quite the same thing as what you write for the stage. So the most theater, pub, uh, theater authors write for the stage, of course. And if it is a success, that version, as you see it on the stage, is then published by theater publishers. But that's not the ideal one to read. It is a good read, but it's not as good as if you wrote exactly the same play by the same author, but for readers, because there's certain things in the theater that says show, don't tell, because an actor can do things without even having to say anything, which you can't do when you just write the play. You have to describe that. So I decided to reverse the process in my last play, which was called Foreplay. And I decided to write Foreplay first for the reader who would buy the book and just read it for pleasure. And then if I find a theater that is interested in staging it, I will then revise that text for the theater together with the uh, director, because directors in any event want to change text, whether you give them permission or not to do it. And I think in a way they should, because one of the exciting things about theater writing instead of ordinary writing is when you write an ordinary book, once you're finished and it's set into print, nothing can be changed. When you finish a play, that's when the whole thing actually starts. The play really only starts living when actors perform it, when dramaturgs and directors, of course, read it, make changes in it here. And then there's a uh, collaborative uh, and synergistic thing which is quite unique and really quite wonderful. <clears throat> so. Uh, in this case, I decided to write it as a book. And then I sent it to three publishers. Now, that would be completely unacceptable I did it in the same country. But I sent it to three publishers in three different languages. So in, in English, in German, and in Spanish. And neither, none of them knew of the other one. And there was no professional competition because they only had their, would have only their rights in that particular language. And something that never happened to me before, and that probably will never happen again, is that all three accepted it within about two weeks, which was unbelievable. And even more amazing, that was a total coincidence, uh, all three came out with it this March. So if you look at my website, you'd actually see the three plays. It will open in London uh, next year as an actual theater play, and I'm now in the process of changing it quite a bit. But I only make a point that one can do this, and plays are worth reading, and Oxygen is one of these. I just want to tell you that. So now I would like to lead you through just a couple of scenes, isolated ones, because I want to make a point that I made before, that the fantastic thing about theater is it can be done differently in different places. So I will show you a couple of scenes that are done first in English, and then I'm gonna show them to you in another language. Because fortunately I have archival videos of some of the ones. Now we don't have time enough to do it. I teach a, a class at Stanford on the science in theater, where for instance I show one scene of which I'll show you only two right now. I'll show you an English and then a Bulgarian scene. And you may wonder why Bulgarian, but that's a very interesting Slavic theater, the Russian tradition. And you'll see the unbelievable difference. I sometimes like to do, I have the same one in Korean, in German, <clears throat> uh, in, uh, what was the other language I had it in? Probably Spanish. <clears throat> and it's actually quite interesting to see the differences. So here I'll show you a scene right now between Lavoisier and uh, Madame Lavoisier. Remember, Lavoisier is one of the three apparent uh, discoverers of oxygen. If you ask any Frenchman, they'll categorically say Lavoisier. They'll never mention Priestley and most certainly not uh, Shelley. Although the facts are that Shelley, the Swede, did it first. Priestley, uh, for four years first. Uh, Priestley, four years later, 
independently discovering it published it first, because Shele wanted to publish in book form and he didn't have a publisher yet. But neither one of these two really understood what they did. It was Lavoisier who understood it, even though it was the last. So who is the discoverer of oxygen? It's an unanswered question in a way. It depends on your views. So <clears throat> in this case, it turns out that Lavoisier, who was by far the wealthiest, the three, and Madame Lavoisier was with a remarkable woman who married at age 13, a very well-educated woman who also helped in the lab, uh, did laboratory pictures and so on. They... Uh, Here's a dialogue between them. Actually, I don't even want to tell you what the dialogue is because you'll see, because that's one of the real puzzles in our play, namely a letter, and that's a real letter that Shele had written to Lavoisier describing his experiments and writing to him and say, try and repeat this. Well, if Lavoisier really read this, then there's no question that he would only be repeating what uh, uh, Shele had already done. So I'm showing you here a scene between uh, Lavoisier and Madame Lavoisier where they're talking about it. Madame Lavoisier was also really his sophisticated secretary and so on. You will meet them both? His Majesty insisted. Before that dinner in Paris... We should have maybe less. I worry. So do I. There are witnesses. And the letter? The letter. Shayla's. got the idea what's going on here. Now look at exactly the same scene. You won't understand a word, but it doesn't make any difference. In Bulgarian. You'll even see how differently it's staged. It's staged in a very minimalist sort of way. Excuse me, just one second. I don't understand what you just said. Now watch it. There's no more word. You can see that's rather different. Uh, so much that one here. Um, I would now like to show you <clears throat> um, another Lavoisier story, <clears throat> which is a true story, <clears throat> namely Lavoisier, Madame Lavoisier, who had also a salon and so on, uh, wrote a play, a mask, which is called The Victory of Oxygen over Phlogiston. Phlogiston was a theory of combustion at that time, which Shele and Priestley favored, which is incorrect, and which uh, Lavoisier demolished through his work. 
through his quantitative work. And they actually wrote a play called the Datorio, the victory of uh, oxygen which was performed uh, in a salon of theirs to their friends, but it was lost. The text is not known. So Roald Hoffman and I wrote the text, and we wrote it in, I uh, uh, wrote a text, and wrote it, of course, in a different language than we would otherwise do it. And I'd like to show you uh, the beginning um, of it first. Uh, and I'll show it to you first in English. Just the beginning of it. I am the vital fire of chemistry, the element that sets the others free. The Greek philosophers were unaware of how I act on water, earth, and air. Without me, phlogiston, the world would be quite unillumed. Rudimentary! Tis in my gift the elements to bind, transforming them to everything we find. Monsieur, you are most glittering and sure of what the world is made of. Tell me more. You say there's a terror this, a terror that. Pray, show me how these elements react. A just inquiry, madame. First, take fire. <laughs> All things that burn release me to the air. Now, <clears throat> what I'll show you <clears throat> is an experiment. Then I'll show you the German. No, maybe I'll show you the German one first. Uh, so you first see theatrical, and then you see something that has been done for a performance that will be done in Berlin and in Zurich this year during the year of chemistry. Uh, this is the German version, not the same beginning, but during that uh, mask, just so you see how totally different this was done. So you get the idea. Totally different. Now. Now, this is a surprise, and it's a very good one. And I'll tell you what we're going to do with this. Very few people have seen this. Yes, yes, y'all, you know that it's on. The rapper on the mic is MC Flaw, just thawing in the chemistry arena. I'm taking on the title, Sire, I'm dire, the fire that is vital. No recital, no rehearsal, won't be no role reversal. Burning up the stage with the element dispersal. You know this, I'm like Moses with chemistry. The element that sets all the others free. Those Greeks can't speak, cause they didn't know Jack. When the flame gets lit, how air and water react. Without me, the whole damn world would be snoring. Cause the flame would be lame and just straight up boring. Knock, knock. Who is it? It's me and I'm gifted. I'm binding elements that I'm finding have drifted. Transforming them into everything is so easy. Like salts and heavy metals, but not ACDC. What more can I say? You know I'm the bomb, the only one under the sun. MC Flaw just dawn. Yes, bro. You know, you talk a really good game, but I'm not quite convinced of the aim of your flame. You seem to say it's like this and like this and like that. Break it down for me. How do these elements react? That's a good question, you're testing my skills But my answers will instill thrills and give you chills Don't be concerned, it's time that you learn I'm released into the air by all things that burn I'm talking charcoal, fat, even French toast And when I'm done blazing, I'm out, I'm ghost You mean you... No, you clearly see it's a rap <clears throat> Now what made us do a rap for 1777? And I really ought to show you again what different theater productions can do we, of course, written it in the way you saw it in the American production. It was in the style of a mask done during the 18th century, it would be quite common. The music was typical recitative music of Monteverde, or someone like composers during that particular time. Uh, a couple of years later, both Roald Hoffman were invited to a premiere at, uh, in Ohio, the States, at Ohio State University. We have a very big theater, and they did part of the season. And they told us something which immediately made me nervous because we didn't know 
how they would stage it and said, we have a surprise for you. Well, yeah, I don't know whether you ever want to be surprised as an author because it could be a good surprise, it could be a lousy one, but there's nothing we could do. So there we sit. We get to this particular scene. The difference was that the two actors who played uh, Madame Lavoisier and Lavoisier were very good singers. So the only difference, they really sang it, and that was fine. But gradually, and it was very subtle, their movements started, you know, they started moving like this, and it started moving pretty rapidly to the year 2000 and Broadway, and suddenly it turned out to be, you know, <laughs> you know, my stiff leg, I can't do this. But suddenly it switched, it was really brilliantly done, this transition. Uh, you know, all the way to very contemporary music as Lavoisier, <laughs> Madame Lavoisier might have done it in the year 2001. Well, this one I thought afterwards, well, they could do that, how about a rap? Which could be even more interesting. And uh, Roald was nervous about this, but in the end we decided to do this. And uh, this will be done this time. And uh, it was done once in Italy, strangely enough, in an English performance in Italy, but this time it will be done in German and in English, in Switzerland, and in, in Berlin, in Zurich. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, we tried it once in Glasgow, but the actors got cold feet because they didn't think they really could do the rap. And I thought, you know, it's the, the, the quasi-director and me, I said, well, if I were the director, I'll tell you how I would do this. Because remember, they're putting a mask on, actually, on their faces. And, well, they could do it... You know, they're now pretending we're starting the, the say, well, let's go out for a moment to put on their mask, and they come, come out. But it could be two, uh, two rap singers who could be having the same costume with the mask, sing the rap, and then when they take the mask off, they step out for a moment, and the actual actors come in. You could have done it that way. But anyway. Um, so you see here, uh, you know, a really interesting difference. Let me show you the experiments. I will show you only quickly one, because the, ex the experiment was done in incredibly different ways. Uh, for example, uh, I saw it uh, <clears throat> uh, in, uh, in June. Uh, there was the first, the Czech premiere, the wonderful theatre in Prague, it was a first class performance. And there, I have to tell you, they essentially did the experiment. It was really quite extraordinary. The, it's strange enough that Prague theatre was called the Broadway theatre. And, uh, but here, I want to show you how the Germans did this. This was the Würzburg uh, uh, production, the experiment, with puppets. And reduce them in the middle of a brennlinse. You see that Schele there, and Schele is asking Lavoisier, who is on the left here, uh, to do the experiment, or, or was there another one had to do it for him? So he's telling him what to do. Okay. Um, now, let me get to the end of Oxygen, namely the last scene, the vote, and um, what happens. Good or poor ethics simply cannot be weighed on the same scale as good or poor science. Uh, but what a precedent for the first retro Nobel. Please, we've had it with the arguments for and against. It's time to make a decision. There are seven combinations of the three names one might imagine. The three men alone, three pairs, and all three together. I admit I'm relieved that Lavoisier never saw Shayla's letter. But does it change the facts? We all know Lavoisier was not the first to discover oxygen. But you still have to understand what you discover. Do you realize that as late as 1800, your man Priestley still wrote a book entitled The Doctrine of Phlogiston Established and the Composition of Water Refuted? In other words, down with H2O and onwards with mumbo jumbo. You're too hard on my experimentalists. The world needs physical chemists like Lavoisier, or better yet, theoreticians. Like you. They could have done worse. But we all know the role women played in chemistry at that time. 
Madame Lavoisier got about as close as was realistic. Now, decisions. There are four committee members and four proposals. Lavoisier alone, Shayla alone, Priestley plus Shayla, and finally all three together. I presume each of you would still vote for his original recommendation. Even if I change my vote and pick one of your choices, that would get us very far. Here's a way to resolve our problem. We each vote for a pair of candidates. Three options only, Lavoisier, Shayla, Lavoisier, Priestley, and Priestley, Shayla. Brilliant, but why waste time going through your exercise of voting for pairs? Simple, it forces everyone to think about another candidate while still holding on to their favorites. And what if we don't have second choices? You more than anyone else in this room should know in life we mostly end up with second you choices. You more than anyone else in this room should know that I can't be forced into a decision. You'll never stop me from trying oh, to persuade right. you, all of you, to arrive at a consensus. Do I have your agreement? Well, as you see, there are seven possibilities. When Hoffman and I wrote this, we ourselves did not agree to whom we would give the Retro Nobel of the seven possibilities. <clears throat> so if we two couldn't agree, <clears throat> you'd think uh, it's all wide open. And it turns out that in various uh, versions, we have different endings. I was broadcast by the BBC on the World Service on December 10, 2001, the, the centenary of the Nobel Prize. We had one ending. The German radio did it also at that time. We had another ending for them. And we have sometimes have even an ambiguous one for the audience really has to decide. And <clears throat> I want to really end, insofar as oxygen is concerned with this, you don't necessarily learn a great deal about the chemistry of oxygen, but you learn what it is all about, why it was important, and uh, the behavioral competitive as well as cooperative things about science, which really is such an important part. So before we now perform something, which we'll now do with copper, I thought I would show you one short scene, which is just, I decided to do it in spur of the moment, <clears throat> of a play that we will not otherwise discuss, Calculus. Because that is a play uh, that was done here at Trinity College, uh, which describes one of the most scandalous uh, priority struggles in science between the two greatest scientists of that time, Sir Isaac Newton in England and Gottfried Leibniz on the continent in, in Germany, who argued for 30 years who was the inventor of the calculus, integral and differential equations. Uh, Newton was the most powerful person in England. Uh, he was the president of the Royal Society, was the master of the mint. He appointed an anonymous committee of 11 members of the Royal Society, of fellows of the Royal Society, where he was the president. He picked the 11. Their identity was not known for 100 years and asked them to adjudicate that, uh, that struggle. Well, you can well imagine if the president asks you to adjudicate and decide whether he's the inventor or someone else, you know for whom they're going to vote. Well, that interested me. I wanted to demonstrate really how important intellectual character at that time were willing to be manipulated by a powerful person and what a horrible example this makes. And I did it through three characters. And I did it as a play within a play. So I would like to show you only one scene, I don't have to really explain it furthermore, between Newton and one of the three men, Dr. Arbuthnot. I don't know whether any of you know who Dr. Arbuthnot is. These are all historical figures. Arbuthnot was a fellow of the Royal Society. He was a physician to Queen Anne. He was a man who was also a literary person. He wrote uh, things with Pope, Alexander Pope, and uh, Swift, and so on. And uh, he coined the word uh, John Bull, you know, Uncle Sam in the stage, John Bull in, in England. He also did some mathematics. He was a fairly honest guy. He was one of these characters. You show, see here only this brief scene between Newton and Arbuthnot. And I want to show how you can do something in the theater, but if you have to describe it, it just won't get come across. And yet I think in this short scene, you can really tell how, how much he manipulated, uh, 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 the, uh, how Newton manipulated these people. <laughs> from London, London production. London, 1712, the following day. 
Mr. Newton waits in the shadows of an antechamber at the Royal Society. Dr. Arbuthnot enters carrying the report. Mr. Newton gestures for him to sit down. <clears throat> Sir Isaac, I deduce that uh, not a word is to be altered in this report, and thus it is to be published unamended even if some members demand? I see, yes, of course. Such protest would be apostasy in your eyes. Unacceptable to the president of the Royal Society. Second, inventors have no rights. Dr. Arba, not none. No, indeed, none whatsoever. But for myself, Sir Isaac, and I speak solely for myself, I hold open disputes in disdain. But so do I, Dr. Arba. Not. No open disputes. In that case, may I make a proposal, Sir Isaac? What is needed here is a unanimous published report. Unanimous. All eleven. Naturally, no exception, none. But for that, the identity of the committee might remain secret. Anonymous committee of gentlemen of several nations. Precisely. And once granted that, might not logical reasoning then not support a request that unanimity by vote of an anonymous committee need not further be confirmed by signature? Hmm? Publication should suffice. Surely it does, Sir Isaac. Does it not? And further, may I venture to assert that under such conditions, unanimity might be assured, Sir Isaac, by all 11. see in this very short scene, <clears throat> you could tell something about the power relationships of these two people, for instance, and get uh, across the extremely domineering character of uh, uh, Newton. The reason why I wrote the play there is uh, to ask a question. Uh, can you be a great scientist at the same time a real shit? In other words, a really dishonest evil person which Newton was and the answer is yes and that is a discouraging answer but it's worth facing and it's worth debating and that's actually why I decided to write the play because very few people knew the real scandal it, this is bad enough what you heard here but what really the case that Newton himself wrote the report and gave it to the 11 people and said this is it that you're going to report now if this were done now uh, you know, he would be kicked out of the Royal Society and perhaps even uh, treated otherwise. Well, uh, could you bring me my bag too while you're coming here, please? Uh, now I'd like to, much shorter, do a second play and do it in this case really as a reading. Please sit down. And the, oh no, we are, I'm sorry, we're doing it standing, yes, of course. And the reason why I yeah, uh, <clears throat> picked this play, which is called Fallacy but it is spelled with PH. Uh, so it doesn't take much imaginations 
what I mean by Y spelled with PH rather than with F. Uh, <clears throat> and this is a play, again, dealing with chemistry. It's not easy to do chemistry on the stage because it's much easier biology or other things because chemists use structural formulas. And structural formulas are complicated unless you deal with things like oxygen or with some of the elements. But in this case, I wanted to write about the interaction between art and science, this case between a chemist and an art historian. And I actually used a real story, which is unknown here uh, in the English-speaking world and little known in Austria, but it really happened about 25 years ago. And I have to tell you very quickly the background. Uh, in the Kunsthistorische Museum, the great museum in Vienna, you know, one of the four greatest museums in Europe, like the Louvre, the British Museum, and so on. In the antiquities uh, uh, collection, uh, uh, antique collection, the antiquities collection, there is one of the most famous sculptures, is a large bronze figure of a naked man, a Roman one, uh, which is supposed to be the oldest intact Roman sculpture discovered north of Italy in the beginning of the 16th century in Austria, in Carinthia, in a place called Magdalensberg, and that's why it's called the young man of the Magdalensberg, or the jüngling of Magdalensberg. And then it's supposed to be a second uh, century cast, a Roman one, that was discovered there, buried, and then it, uh, <clears throat> uh, first the Bishop of Salzburg acquired it, then they gave it to the emperor, and the emperor, <clears throat> This was going to be a great thing. And then, remember the Habsburgs, there were the Austrian Habsburgs and the, and the Spanish Habsburgs, uh, Charles V, they were even more powerful. And the story goes that uh, uh, Charles V uh, asked his Austrian colleague, uh, I mean, colleague, uh, relative, uh, to give him that sculpture. And well, he had to do this. But apparently, this is now the explanation. He wasn't at that time. Uh, that they first made a cast, the Austrians. And they found out that the cast was so much prettier than the original because the patina was fresh, that they sent the original to Spain and kept the 15th century cast. Well, that is the current explanation, but how did it arise? There was that 20 years ago, the director of the big museum contacted two Austrian chemists, Wendel and Pichler, who were specialists in bronze internationally well-known ones, have developed all kinds of techniques and said, would you check this particular sculpture, which has been in a museum for a couple hundred years and no one has had any question that in PhD theses and books and stuff about them. And these chemists in a couple of weeks discovered it is impossible. It couldn't be a second century cast. It had to be a 15th century cast. And that created a scandal and a real argument between the art historians and the chemists. Now, I then came up with a compromised and amusing one, which of course I won't tell you. We're only going to play a part of the first scene. But you'll see immediately how, <coughs> what I want to do, uh, write about. Namely, and that is very dangerous in science, again part of this idiosyncratic behavior. When you make a discovery, a particular theoretical one, but sometimes also experimental as a scientist, and it really is so beautiful, the experiment, aesthetically beautiful, that you say it has to be true, and you fall in love with it. And when you fall in love with a hypothesis, you ignore warning signals or even evidence against it. And that you have in science and you have in other disciplines. And that is a very classic example of it here. Now the play, we actually doing the second scene. The play starts, oh, there are two, the two main characters are the director of the art, uh, the, uh, Antiquities collection, uh, Dr. Regina Leitner Opfermann. Well, if you knew German, you'd know what Leitner means and what Opfermann means, but that's besides the point. Regina. I'm the chemist, Rex Stolzfus. Rex and Regina. So I have done this chemical work. The play actually starts with Regina Stolzfus giving a lecture to a group of high school students. So it starts that way. The audience, the high school students, and she describes that sculpture and she starts talking about bronze and what bronze is, uh, copper, addition of trace minerals, uh, etc., etc. It started with the Greeks and went to the Romans and so on. 
and more or less also poo poos chemistry. They say, well, but who cares about chemistry? It's really the aesthetics of it. And of course, that's understandable. And then she gets interrupted by some of the audience who is a student and interrupts her because she talks about the difference between a caste, a second century caste, a 15th century caste. And the student asks her a question and she gets irritated and he kept belaboring. Finally, she said, Enough, we are going now on the tour and then we, you can read my book. Well, and then they leave, and the second scene is now between the chemist and uh, Regina. That student who interrupted uh, turned out to be the son of a chemistry professor, just so you know this, but that's not important. All right. <clears throat> and you think that was appropriate, telling your son that we're on the results that we're only discussing now? It's not a state secret. Your museum director asked me to take a look at your sculpture. Take a look? Yes. We developed some new chemical methods. We got some top-notch new equipment, state-of-the-art. What's wrong with the museum commissioning a new approach to confirm the putative age of a sculpture? Putative? It's not an insult. More often than not, age is considered putative until it's confirmed, even the age of a person. Take my son. In another couple of years, he'll have to produce a driver's license in order to buy a drink. And our museum director came to you for the driver's license for this bronze? No, nah, just a parking permit. <clears throat> Doubts have been expressed whether it truly belongs into the antiquities uh, gallery. Are you aware um, of the evidence I've amassed over years of research? Summarized in a scholarly book that has already been reprinted. By your museum bookshop. You've read the book? I always read evidence before questioning it. So you read my book from beginning to end? Eventually, but I started at the end. So you mean the last chapter? Uh, the index. The index? Yes, the index. And looked for the words trace analysis and nickel. Why did you start with those words? Because Roman bronze has a very low nickel content. Well, I am delighted to hear that. I wouldn't be if I were you. Why not? Your sculpture contains a lot of nickel, rather typical of the Renaissance bronze. And you told this to our museum director? Of course. Instead of coming to me? But he was the one who requested we examine your sculpture anyway. What matters here is the nickel content. So what you're saying is that our sculpture could not be of Roman origin? that all Roman bronzes, without exception, had low nickel content. No, I didn't say without exception. Ah, you see? I'm saying it's extremely unlikely, and that's why I'm here as a courtesy call to tell you before informing anyone else what additional chemical tests we carried out to prove our assumption. Oh, so you're just making an assumption. Well, no, because we carried out further tests. No, nonetheless, these tests were all based on your assumption. You assume that the sculpture is a Renaissance work, that all the evidence in my book, all 345 pages, is hogwash. Well, uh, hogwash, no, I wouldn't say that. Not exactly hogwash. You see, this is what I find so infuriating. You, you slavishly follow the rules of chemistry you learned as a student, lessons you now teach to your students, who who will then teach it to their students? It's sterile crap. Crap? I said sterile crap. Consisting of rules promoted by art-hating boors, shielded from any sense of beauty by a dense fog spread from ear to ear. You disembowel every vestige of aesthetics. You ignore style, form, patina, in fact, all cognitive accompaniments. Excuse me? Someone really ought to prick that balloon of self-righteous, pompous, simplistic arrogance of yours. You may live to regret those words. No, 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 no not simplistic. Cock, sure. Transforming the wine of aesthetics into vinegar. I'm typical of you chemists. When chemists dabble with art, the best that can be said is that the results are unpredictable. But unpredictability is what science is all about. Oh, is it really? And even if it is, then why doesn't that teach you humility rather than arrogance? And why not recognize the importance of visual beauty? A concept that barely exists in your chemical world. For this discussion, the beauty of the sculpture is not important. Even the sculpture is not important. Yes, so what is? Truth. Well, that's all? That's all. Pathetic. And if the beauty of this sculpture is not important, what about art? Define art. An, an image from the mirror of life. Good God. All right then, all right, all right. How about art being everything other than what you see in a mirror? Mm, better. And how necessary is that? 
Art is never necessary, it just happens to be indispensable. What do you think of clay? We're talking about bronze, not clay. Paul Clay. Oh, I see. Oh, so you, so you have heard of him? I don't have to put up with this. Yeah, well, well how do you like clay? Is this relevant? Mm -hmm, indeed. Because here's what Clay told a chemist. What kind of a chemist? Analytical, organic, physical? Or was it a cook that he mistook for a chemist? Famous chemist. What's his name? A Nobel Prize winning chemist who liked lecturing to artists about his scientific theory of colour. Ah, don't tell me. Wilhelm Ostwald. Yes, if you must know. And what did Clay say to, uh, to Ostwald? Your scientific ideas just fetter us artists. They renounce the wealth of the soul. Thanks, but no thanks. Well, what's good enough for Paul Clay is certainly good enough for me. So let me repeat, thanks, but no thanks. I am trying to be collegial. Collegial? I want to explain how we arrived at our conclusion. You think I need an explanation? Oh, pardon me, I forgot. You have no use for trace metal analysis, but you're an expert in thermoluminescence and scanning electromicroscopy in their scope and limitations. Yeah, but well, their limitations, exactly. I've had it. You're impossible. Here, read it. I don't need to read this. I'll just file it in the only place I file such rubbish. In that case, wait till it's published and the shit hits the fan. Well, you plan to publish this? That's it. If you... If you want to see the rest of the play, you can convince the Abbey Theatre here to perform it. <laughs> and if you haven't got any poor there, you can read it. Uh, you can actually find it on my website, so you don't have to buy the book. Well, I think uh, it's enough examples, because, see, you do learn in the play, actually, quite a bit about bronze. And you see some very good slides, uh, pictures, images of that picture. You see, <clears throat> I learn a lot about casting and uh, about arguments and behavior of the two of them. Uh, you see, learn even something about publication practices. So these were two plays that I wanted to give examples of chemistry and science. Actually, it occurred to me that, is this still, or have I shut it off? With this, yeah, I'll t might as well, this comes from a pedagogic play and then, then I'm really finished. And it's called NO, nitric oxide, because that is the other pedagogic play that I wrote with a French chemist, in this case, uh, Pierre Laszlo, uh, which is published in one small book in English, German, and French, again for classes. In this case, trying to illustrate the chemistry of nitric oxide. Uh, well, the chemistry of nitric oxide is pretty simple. You know, it's just nitrogen and oxygen. It's, bi it's biosynthesis. And the biological function is extremely complicated. And nitric oxide, one of the simplest chemicals that exists, has an unbelievable range of biological actions, which already won, uh, won Nobel Prize and undoubtedly in 1998, undoubtedly will another one. Uh, in addition to that, it is a causative action of penile erection. And in fact, if you want to know anything about the mechanism of how the Viagra works, you'd have to understand how it does it via nitric oxide. So in this play, uh, this pedagogic play. When we're finished, then as in any scientific lecture, and this is of course not a lecture, it's a debate between three people in that case, you have a summary. And in this case, we decided to summarize what happened in the following way, and then I promise that is the end. Uh, and you'll see, I uh, hope this will work. It's the end to the O, you know it don't stop It's time to break it down in the form of hip-hop The N is for nitric, the O is for oxide It's got a lot of scientists riled up worldwide It's such a hot topic and you saw it today In A and B and BC's horseplay And here we are y'all, nearly at the end of it But before we go we want to recall all the benefits If you take notes you can use your pen So once again, the key applications of N-O They made it very clear in the first section that without
trick. The O is for oxide. It's got a lot of scientists riled up worldwide. Six. And no is a neurotransmitter function. That means if you spot someone hot at the luncheon and your brain tells you that you just gotta do something. And no helped you out, now your heart is just pumping. You approach and your blood is flowing like a river. You can also thank a no for that because it helps deliver and regulate your blood flow so you don't go straight to heaven. That was number seven. In case you're slow. Number eight. Now who would have thought from the start that NO would then go and help the heart treats cardiac condition through the sodilation because it's liberated by nitroglycerin administration. I know that's a mouthful, but yo, it's not doubtful that NO is more exciting than Gwyneth Paltrow. Number nine. Almost number nine. done. Come on, we're on a roll. NO could be useful in birth control. And on the flip side, there's a high possibility that it could even help in improving fertility. That's right, NO has a hand in human reproduction. We're almost at the end. No need for introduction, because in conclusion, it's no illusion that NO is a powerful, helpful solution to many different problems and needs of the body. Sometimes it does nice things and sometimes naughty. Who would have thought that we'd start all these talks again from one atom of nitrogen, one atom of oxygen? If someone says nitric oxide, now you know. Tell them like Nancy Reagan did just say NO. Any questions? <laughs> How will you handle the questions? Yeah, we have time for a few questions. So uh, we have a mic up at the back and a mic here. So um, we just have time for a few. So if you have a question, wait until the microphone gets to you. Um, so that everybody can hear your question. So I think you ought to have light on the audience, not just of me. I can barely see them, but okay. Not fair that way. <laughs> um, anybody want to start us off? Yeah, there. Uh, thank you very much for uh, a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, it's a two-part question. One is, how useful was it to collaborate uh, with others? And secondly, you collaborated with other scientists. How did that work, as opposed to um, one would imagine a, a scientist uh, would, would probably pick a, a playwright to collaborate with, but you collaborated with uh, other scientists, and how, how did that work? Well, you ask a very pertinent question. Uh, if you look at the history of, of the theatre, you'll find <clears throat> that very few plays are written by two people. Uh, the most famous probably is Fletcher and Beaumont, uh, which were <clears throat> two people prior to Shakespeare, who wrote at least a dozen plays together and so on. But on the whole, it's very few, uh, unless you have two distinct functions, like in a musical, the Brett is a musician. It's very few. Just you have very few people who write novels together. Uh, poetry is, there's one exception, a Japanese one, the Renga style poetry. But otherwise, it's difficult. It's difficult, because really writing is a solitary uh, occupation. Uh, and I think should be that. Uh, Roald and I were good friends. I uh, still are good friends. That's really important. And uh, we realized the thing is dangerous. We also, you know, are both prima donnas, quite frankly. So we recognized this. So it wasn't a question in a, in a scientific hierarchy when you collaborated many papers. There's a senior author, another one, and so on. Here there were two senior authors equals and would not yield to any other. And we, we felt in this play that <coughs> we each had <coughs> to contribute something because it's historically, <coughs> excuse me, a very accurate play. And we really had to learn uh, the details about Shele, Priestley, and Lavoisier, and especially their wives. <coughs> so we decided to allocate it. He did the Lavoisier's, I did uh, Shele, <coughs> and we split Priestley. So that helped. The other problem was that he was in Ithaca and I was partly in London and partly in San Francisco. So we probably exchanged at least 2,000 emails. And if it were not for tracked mode, so one of us would write one scene first, send it to the other one, and he makes his comments in, let's say, red, and I get it back, and you know, I had my comments, which is now in blue, and I send it back to him, it's now in green, and it looks like you know, a mess of color. But in the end, you know, you can say accept, and it all turns into black and white. But we did something very wise. We realized that there would be uh, conflicts, and there were. 
and we should anticipate them. And we had sort of a premarital, uh, prenuptial <laughs> agreement and said, what happens if we disagree and we can't resolve it? And we said we would then pick a recognized dramaturg, and we actually picked one <clears throat> whom I happen to know, but <clears throat> that made no difference. He was uh, at that time the dramaturg of BBC Radio of their play division, uh, and was a very good one. And that we would send him our two versions without telling him who wrote what, and asked him to adjudicate. And I think that'd be done about three or four times, that was about all. And on the whole, it really worked. Uh, but I don't recommend that uh, on the whole. It's first of all, without doubt, it takes longer because you've got to compromise and you have to exchange things. And uh, I would say I get the greatest pleasure out of uh, writing during the writing process. Uh, the revision process is already slightly different. And when you start getting criticism from other people, and it's very important that you get it, then, of course, the really serious problems also arise. So I think you have to enjoy that, uh, that pleasure, I think, more or less by yourself. So I intend to say that that's a solitary occupation. Uh, it didn't make much difference. It probably helped that we were both scientists because we knew something about the process of collaboration. Because in science, that is almost indispensable. The days of single authors are almost gone. And you have to learn the compromises, the concessions, and also the advantages you have in, in working with someone. So that was, that's it. Hi. Um, I, I was wondering uh, if you could maybe talk could a you little hold it to bit closer. Um, I was okay. wondering if you could talk maybe a little bit about uh, where you got your interest in theatre where that came from, and, um, and your influences. And the other question is, it strikes me that it's quite unusual um, to, to have, have had such great achievements uh, in the area of science and then in the area of theatre. And uh, I, what really strikes me is, given what you had achieved in chemistry, uh, given your reputation, uh, was it risky um, putting your first play out into the world and waiting for feedback? Let me start with that because it's a very good question. <clears throat> That's a real problem. <clears throat> uh, first of all, there aren't many chemists who write plays, as far as I know. <clears throat> uh, there are plenty of physicians who do. Some of the most famous playwrights, let's say, Chekhov or Schnitzler, are physicians. I think the reason is very simple. We chemists work with molecules. Physicians deal with human beings. Plays are about human beings. They aren't about molecules. Uh, but that is probably also why I, as a chemist, and Roald Hoffman, who has since written another couple of plays, where they were, one dealt with science, the other one did not, also did this. We focus on the human behavior of scientists, even though we use some scientific issue. You saw that, whether it's a bronze, the age of a bronze, or discovery of oxygen or the nitric oxide, but most of it's <clears throat> the human, the, the behavior, the positive and negative aspects, and there are plenty of both of scientists around that. Now that, <clears throat> I think, is, a question, is dramatic and I think is worth telling, and that's why I chose to do it. Uh, when you ask me how did I get to theater, let's say I I've <clears throat> go probably to 30 or 40 plays a year, and I've done this for some decades. And because they're only plays of a certain type, for instance, let's say my favorite playwright probably is Tom Stoppard, but it's that type of plays that I go to, or Alan Bennett or something like that. So um, I've seen an awful lot of these, and I'm a total autodidact, but you, that's the only way you really learn. The other enormous advantage that I have, and I'll come to disadvantage in just a second, is uh, I did this, well, I wrote my first play when I was in my by early 70s. That's an advantage. Uh, it's one of the few endeavors where I think advanced age is an advantage. I can't think of anything else. For instance, I very much like to be a very good cello player because I love the cello and I played it once, but it's hopeless. If I start the cello now, it would be ridiculous. I probably could play Haydn trios, but not you know, any, uh, any Bach solo <laughs> uh, pieces. Uh, because you have a lot of experience. You've 
you've met a lot of people, you've known a lot of situations, and you know, ought to know more about human interactions than a person, however brilliant a writer is, uh, who is in his 20s. So I think there was an advantage. The disadvantage is coming from chemistry, and then going to playwriting. I made a mistake, and I, there's no way of correcting that, of course. I should have written on the unknown diploma. I should have written as a completely different person. Because uh, the first question that always asked about the chemist, so he did some important work in chemistry, what the hell does he know about playwriting? And I can tell you, there are plenty of theater people who are extremely nervous when they see a scientist appear. Because science is not something that, I know of essentially no theater director or uh, people around theater who are comfortable with science plays. I really have to tell you that. And the few that are science plays, that you could call that, let's say Copenhagen, uh, which is a very good example, or Michael Frayn, or, or Blinded by the Sun by Polyakov, or even a couple of plays of, uh, of Stoppard, Arcadia could be called, partly of that here. Uh, these are very well-known, famous playwrights who use science for their purposes. So they come from here and arrive at stage to an audience. I come from over there as a scientist who would like to use a theater. They want to use uh, science for the theater. Uh, it's very, a very totally different approach. I know too much about science. They know too little about science. Uh, but actually, it's, I think, an advantage to know less than more because then you feel obligated to be accurate and to show off and bring in all kinds of really esoterica that really of no interest to the audience who, in a way, wants to be uh, amused and entertained. I do have... A, uh, pedagogic motive, uh, didactic one, which I now try to hide greatly because didactic is the most insulting term that literary or theater critics have for a novel, for a play. So I, and I'm now pretty good at hiding it. I was probably not that good in the beginning. But I can also tell you, I sit between two stools because the chemist who has uh, scientists, in my case, the chemists think I'm just playing around. They just think, well, you know, you can write a play in the evening, just uh, your spare time or a novel or something like this. They're dreaming, but, you know, uh, the serious stuff is work in the lab. So as far as they're concerned, I, you know, I've abandoned them in sitting somewhere in there. The, the others, uh, on the other side, feel that I'm butting in their territory. You know, I come from the wrong place. I'm, I, I'm an autodidact. I'm a good autodidact. I, I've had advantage, but that they probably don't know that I've read a lot uh, in terms of before I wrote novels, and I've uh, seen a lot of plays. And I think you learn, but I also have advantage, I don't know the rules of it. There are certain rules of writing plays, and there are certain rules of writing fiction. I really only discovered them much later when I broke them, and discovered that breaking them actually is fine, because one should not write according to a certain formula. So, a long, wishy-washy answer to your question. <laughs> I think you have someone way up there somewhere. Um, I guess my question is, uh, you spoke earlier about the importance of uh, scientists and science being able to connect with the public, um, and that there does seem to be this gulf between uh, scientists and the public. And quite often, uh, as lay people, we encounter science through people who aren't scientists, through uh, news reports or that sort of thing where it's, it's uh, m you know, had omissions and, and a lack of context and that sort of thing. Um, and we've seen how through your, uh, as you called it, your smuggling, you've been able to, to try to take your own approach to that. Um, but what would you suggest could be done for uh, scientists at large, like say uh, through um, within education programs, to try to help equip scientists to bridge that gulf, whether it's in uh, interviews or in their work in general? Um, you ask a, uh, a very insightful question, which is not very easy to answer for the following reason. It depends, first of all, which scientist you're talking about who will, doing the, will do the communicating. My problem was and the problem I describe is that those people who are really very serious research chemists, uh, scientists, don't have to be chemists, but chemists is good enough, are total workaholics. 
Uh, I mean, if you work in a competitive institution like Stanford, you know, the students and the faculty work between 69 and 82 hours a week. And uh, words like vacation is a dirty word. And if you're not there in the evening or on weekends, you're a slacker. And uh, first of all, it's absurd that we lead that life. But if you do, there's very little time for these extra things. And we give no brownie points. Uh, I'm not talking about academia. To faculty members who do this, and particularly as a lesson that younger faculty members in competitive universities, I'm using mine as an example, but uh, I can wheel off uh, a couple of dozen just American universities that I don't even have to speak about uh, other countries. Uh, uh, so they know if they are up for tenure, let's say an assistant professor, and he spends part of his time on that. Actually, I'm writing a play about exactly this now, a place called Insufficiency, and deals with someone who does not get tenure. Uh, then uh, you're not going to get it for that. You ought to, in part, but you don't. And that is a lesson that's been learned, and I would say that among the well-known, very workaholic research scientist is only the older ones who can afford to do that, to finally do it, because they can't be penalized anymore. Uh, but I have to give you the, you probably won't know the story here, but in the United States, uh, 10 years ago, it was, it was on page one of the New York Times. And that was a dramatic example that gave a horrible example to many others. I don't know how many of you still know who Carl Sagan was. Carl Sagan was a very well-known astronomer, professor of astronomy at, uh, at Cornell, and an extremely successful TV personality, popularizing science in a brilliant way, very popular. Also wrote some science fiction, but also popular uh, books. But probably the best communicator among the really serious scientists. He was not a member of the National Academy of Sciences, which was to me remarkable. Uh, and the election process in the National Academy is very complicated. It takes a couple of years. But then he was once up for election when he was already famous. And uh, he had a very high rating. And in general, it then just gets rubber stamped. But there's one thing you can do in the National Academy of Sciences votes. At the annual meeting where only 10% of the membership may be there, if someone objects to someone about whom they're just going to vote, you can blackball that person. Blackball in the context that you stop his election and it has to be debated right there by the 10% of the people who are there and then they vote on him. That happened, in my experience, and I've been a member for I don't know how many decades, I've never been, pre I've been present once, actually. And that happened to, uh, to him. And you should see the debate. The people said, one person was a chemist who got up and said, why should we elect this guy who's just all the time on TV, on the newspaper and so on? You know, the important thing, you ought to do astronomy and publish in the astronomy journals and so on. Yeah, and you won't believe it. But he actually was not elected. And that was, uh, was supposed to be kept quiet. But of course, it leaked out instantaneously. The New York Times said it on page one the following year. Well, that is a lesson that people very well learned. But now let's take the other side. I'm only talking about those scientists. Uh, first of all, there are professional science journalists who, in my opinion, do a first-class job because it's very difficult to really make science accurately, keep it accurate, and yet bring it to a general public. And they are professionals in that. But they don't have to worry about tenure. Their reward system is a different one within their community. Uh, of, uh, uh, of these. But there's an in-between, and that is the one that I selected. Uh, rather than trying to now do what sci some science journals do very, very well, uh, why bother to compete with it? I don't think I can do it that much better. But I can do something about the behavior and culture of science. I, my fiction writing has been a form of autopsychoanalysis. I've really written uh, largely about the foibles and the problems of scientists, and I include myself. It's a form of mea culpa. Uh, and uh, that, I think, is worth doing, because there you have to be an insider. If you want to write about the behavior, let's say, of monks, you can't be a 
a journalist writing about Trappist monks. You have to join a Trappist monastery and be there for at least three or four years and get up every morning at four in the morning and start praying at that time and don't speak to anyone like this. And then after four or so years, go out and then talk about the culture and, and what motivates or perhaps inhibits Trappist monks. I'm using an extreme. Uh, I'm an insider. Uh, I'm an insider and I am a critical insider of my own tribe. I'm partly proud of the tribe, but I think we have made many mistakes. And if I could do them over again, I probably would do them. And that, I think, is a role that uh, all the scientists can play because they can't, ki you know, they can't kick me out of the National Academy. Uh, so uh, there's nothing they really can do to me to stop me from doing this. Uh, there are plenty of scientists uh, who don't think very much of what I'm doing. There are others that do think of it. Uh, but, you know, c'est la vie. Yeah, the only people who should pick him up who really promise to read them, yeah? yeah. yeah. Or perform them.